Hello, everyone. I'm Charlie Kyle, the principal of Innes College, and welcome to the Nazarene event. I will begin with the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the the opportunity to work and celebrate on this land. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be the introducer to this event that is centered on the film Nazreen. Uh, we will be joined by the two of the filmmakers, uh, director writer Jeff Kaufman and producer Marsha Ross, and also an authority on the topic, Payam Akavan. Uh, but it is my really sole duty um, here to introduce our moderator. And I will simply say that uh, this event is a collaboration uh, between Innes College and New College, and in particular, uh, the program Studies in Equity and Solidarity, uh, Critical Studies, sorry, in Equity and Solidarity uh, at New College. And the director of that program is Sharzad Mohab. And I'll say that Sharzad and I go way back, probably farther back than either of us wants to admit, uh, but Sharzad was actually my first administrative mentor um, back when I had another administrative post. And I learned so much from her graciousness and warmth during those times of uh, her counseling me on how to navigate administrative waters. And I've always appreciated her approach to all matters and I was grateful that we finally had the opportunity after many years about talking about doing so to collaborate on a project. So um, I want to thank Sharzad for actually bringing in us into uh, this idea that she already had and for us to be able to facilitate it on a technical level, but I would say the inspiration is all hers. Um, I also want to just briefly acknowledge the collaboration of Penn Canada uh, that does great work and uh, we're very thankful for them uh, taking part in this as well. So let me introduce Sharzad uh, in a more official capacity now. Um, Sharzad is a scholar, teacher, and activist, is internationally known for her work on the impact of war, displacement, and violence on women's learning and education. Uh, her work also includes examining women political prisoners. A feature of that work is making knowledge accessible to the public through the use of arts, such as storytelling, dance, drama, painting, and film. Her work, is related, her work that is related to women political prisoners in the Middle East is archived in her website, web, website sorry, The Art of Resistance in the Middle East. Her recent project on prison poetry is aesthetically presented in a new book entitled Lives Lost, in search of a new tomorrow. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the uh, discussion of the film, which I'm assuming everyone's already seen. And with that, I will turn it over to Sharzad. Thank you very much, uh, Charlie. Uh, and uh, it is a uh, great pleasure to be here and then doing this work with uh, all of you uh, and then also my, my wonderful colleagues. So let me begin by saying that today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And since the outbreak of, of the global pandemic, most reports indicate the intensification and the rise of violence against women and girls at home and in workplaces, especially among those who are working uh, in the frontline, uh, they are frontline workers or in the uh, providing essential services, especially in health services. Therefore, it is the day of remembrance and action. In the context of this, our discussion, we should remember thousands of women political prisoners who are incarcerated amidst this pandemic and have to continue their detention under oppressive political and health-wise condition, not only in Iran, but in the region, and also the, by, by the region, I mean the Middle East, but also the rest of the world. 
The month of November in Iran is known as the bloody November, Aban Khunin, where a series of nationwide civil and unpeaceful uh, protests were brutally suppressed. The government shut down the internet for a week. The, the, depending on, on different reports, up to uh, 1,500 protesters uh, have been killed. And then also, it has been a year of nonstop arrest, imprisonment, and torture. Just to give you a sense of, of the scale of, of suppression, let me quote from Iran Human Rights Group that between 2019 and 2020, 53 human rights activists have been arrested and have sentenced to in total of 400 years of imprisonment and 787 lashes. Nasrin Setude is among this group. Though she is temporarily released, but she is not free. She is thankfully recovering from COVID-19 at home, but our international effort to free her and all other political prisoners should continue. This is also what Nasrin said immediately as, um, uh, after she was temporarily released from prison. Therefore, in this context, there is a lot for us to discuss and think through by using this documentary as a sort of a tool for all this conversation that we need to have. This panel is the work of many dedicated people and my colleague and principal of, of Ennis College, uh, Professor Charlie uh, Kyle, who enthusiastically accepted my invitation for a screening of, of, of this film has been, his, 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 his commitment has been invaluable for doing this. Wonderful staff of, of Ennis Town Hall, Rola Taher, Jim Wong, Kathleen uh, McCarthy, Ennis Blentick, Ben Westray, Hannah Fleisch, and Max Hazen have been put enormous amount of, of time pulling this, this work together. But welcome to all of you who have watched the film or will continue watching it and also uh, to be here uh, today. Now, most importantly, I would like to thank for the presence and participation and the generosity of the filmmakers, producers, Marshall Ross and Jeff Kaufman, and especially that they are here this morning so early in LA, 8 a.m. or so. I'm also delighted to welcome my great colleague and friend, Professor Payam Akhavan, to help us to navigate the train of human rights violation in Iran, in the region, actions to be taken, and the forging of international so solidarity, which is extremely needed at this very difficult time. So I will start our conversation with Marsha Ross, who is one of the filmmakers and a very well-known documentary filmmaker who has produced other documentaries such as uh, Every Act of Life, The State of Marriage, Father Joseph, and The Savoy King. She has a long list of film and television credits and has received Career Achievement Awards from the Casting Society of America and the Hollywood Film Festival. Welcome, Marsha. It's so good to have you here. Thank and you. I will start by this question that I think that it is in the mind of, of, of many uh, people that first, why did you want to do this film? And what was your motivation for choosing Nasrin as the subject of your film? Marsha? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having us and for showing the film today. So um, Jeff had made a film several years ago called Education Under Fire about uh, the persecution of the Baha'i faith in Iran and you know, Baha'is in Iran um, are not really uh, accepted by the government. They're not allowed to have education. They don't really get the same legal rights as other people in the society. 
And what really impressed him was, um, you know, Muslim neighbors helping their Baha'i friends and, and, you know, with the underground schools and a lot of other things that they were doing for them. And uh, at that time, actually, you know, we came across Nazreen at that time. And uh, because she represents Baha'is, even though she's a Muslim woman. And uh, we were finishing our last film, Every Act of Life, about um, a Broadway uh, playwright and, and theater legend, Terrence McNally. And we were thinking about what we would do next. And both of us have been interested in human rights uh, for a long time. But I think, you know, both of us are really interested in, in, in you, you know, people, individuals who really try to make a difference in society in a way that um, makes, really makes a difference in the lives of other people in a very selfless way, where they're not always recognized for the work that they do, but the work that they do really changes lives. And, um, and it's not for acclaim, it's not for fame. And the subjects of all our films really share that in common. And Nazreen's to us really seemed to, sh to have that quality. The work that she was doing on behalf of so many people she was doing for a greater cause at great risk to herself. And, um, and yet she really helped so many people and we felt that her story really needed to be told. Thank you so much. And um, the, can you share with us a memory that you have uh, from making the film? And probably I, I'll just uh, let you know, Jeff, that I will ask you this question too. But Marsha, what is your special memory of, of making the film? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna make it hard for Jeff because, you know, this is a story that uh, when we were working with our uh, press representative on the press kit, we each were asked to write memories that we had of uh, making the film. You know, what was something that we both remembered and we were doing it. We were also happy to be married, but we were doing it in separate parts of the house. And when we came together and we shared that memory, we shared what we had written, we wrote the same memory. And that was uh, one day we would go to Brooklyn because we had translators helping us in Brooklyn and we would, you know, talk with Nazreen and Reza, um, you know, via Skype or WhatsApp or, you know, you know that kind of th FaceTime. And we were talking to Nazreen and she was in a park in Tehran and, uh, you know, FaceTiming with us. And we were talking about the film and, you know, her desire to see the film finished. I mean, I can see her so perfectly in her raincoat and her scarf, you know, you know, and um, two days later she was arrested. And that was very shocking. And she wasn't arrested because of what we were doing. As you know, she was arrested because of her representation of the girls of Revolution Street. And that's just a memory that uh, has really stuck with me for, for such a long time. Um, the, uh, that, that, that sort of there she was and then she was gone. And um, I would say for me, that was quite profound. And recently I have to say, you know, when she's been out on her um, medical furlough, we got to see her again after two and a half years. And that was so emotional for me personally, because, you know, when you make a film, you live with that person every day. I mean, why we were making the film, obviously we were going back and forth with, with Reza and Nazreen and the family in Iran. But um, the two and a half years she was gone, we were finishing the film, we were editing the film, you know, we were working on launching the film, you know, so many things, working on the trailer, working on a music video. And so she has been such a deep part of our life, you know, for the last four years. And to see her again was just such, a, such an emotionally profound moment for me. Thank you so much. Um, I come uh, back to you, uh, Marsha, but let me introduce uh, Jeff, Jeff Kaufman, uh, who has uh, written and directed and produced in collaboration with you a lot of, of, of uh, excellent films. He has also produced a number of short films for Amnesty International, programs for the Discovery Channel and the History Channel. So good to have you with us, uh, Jeff. Um, in the description of the Nasreen documentary, all the materials that has been produced, there is a sentence there that it says that Nasreen documentary was secretly filmed in Iran by women and men who risk being arrested to make this film. And um, also explains that Nasreen will help shatter simplistic stereotypes about Iranian women by showing their strength, courageous agency, 
And this documentary is grounded in social movements for equal rights, dignity, and justice. In the courts and on the streets, Nasreen has long fought for the rights of women, children, LGBTQ prisoners, religious and ethnic minorities, journalists, workers, artists, and those facing the death penalty. So will you tell us a little bit more about what was the process and challenges, including funding and also filming in Iran? And then again, the same question that I asked uh, uh, from Marsha, that what was your, a, a special memory that you have about this film? Thank you, Jeff. Sure, and you can prompt me if I miss something along the way. Um, I will say that, um, and, and let me just start by saying that um, Marsh and I just are so grateful to be part of this event. Uh, I've, we've loved everyone we've met at Innes College and through Innes College. And um, if you're thinking about what can I do to participate, what can I do to make a difference? You know, one thing is obviously supporting human rights groups and, uh, and supporting Nazreen, and you can go to our website and all that. But the other thing is just what we're experiencing here and what you see it in this college, which is just make yourself as smart as possible. Know as much about culture and history and how we got here. You know, the challenges that we're all facing are enormous. And some people go into those challenges like the Trump administration with like zero sense of history and zero sense of respect for expertise. And so I just, I just have to say, I, I find very energetic and inspiring what you are, are presenting here because it represents, I think, really the way forward. So um, just to say that. But uh, uh, you're asking about the process. And it, it's funny, um, Nazreen and Reza's daughter, Marava, who's a talented young artist, at one point, just a couple months ago, said to Reza, said to her father, um, you know, the process of releasing the film is almost as exciting as making the film. <laughs> and it is true that, that there's a, a lot of steps behind the scenes that aren't in the film, uh, but that, uh, that involve uh, remarkable people and a lot of work. Uh, we were really privileged to work with incredibly talented people in Iran who put themselves at great risk. We couldn't just, first of all, I've done like five films about Iran, so I couldn't just go to Iran as a tourist, unfortunately. I would do it in a heartbeat if I could. But even if we could roll in with a big crew and start filming, that's not the way to get intimate footage of Nazreen on the streets and you know, going to the, the theater and going to art galleries and in protests. So instead, we were able to work with some very talented people who um, put themselves at risk to, to shoot this film. And I must say also that, you know, part of making a film is getting everyone to sign a release. So everyone who is in the film and you see on, on screen, they know that they're putting themselves at some risk to be in this film. They all did that willingly. Um, and, you know, we, they have our endless admiration for that. Um, one of the things we wanted to do in the film is, um, I have enormous respect for the Iranian culture. It's so rich and deep and, and, and long. And so, and Nazreen, like as Marcia was mentioning, Terence McNally, the subject of our previous film, really believes that the arts can help push society forward, that the two uh, politics and the arts uh, are, are interconnected, but oftentimes the arts are a step ahead, showing the way. Um, and um, Nazreen loves, um, poetry and cinema and theater and, and art and she makes beautiful work herself and so we wanted to pay tribute to a, a part of Iran that people don't often see while also paying tribute to uh, these remarkable people in the film. Let me mention one more thing and I hope I'm checking off the boxes in your question uh, but um, we started making this film also at a time when there was a lot of anti- Islam sentiment being ginned up in America for political purposes, and a lot of anti-Iran sentiment, which has a strange connection to history, but also is not in proportion to um, the way other countries are treated in the Middle East. Uh, and it was all highly distressing. And that was sort of a subcontext for us. And um, it's been very distressing to see what's happened with US-Iran policy over the last four years. But we hope that um, this film could be part of a process to break down some barriers, break down some misunderstanding, and see the commonalities 
um, there's differences and we can't hide those, but there's also great commonality. And, and I hope that there's a way for both countries to communicate better to work together better and to, you know, have, have a sense of what a positive future can be. Thank you so much, Jeff. I mean, this, this uh, will be possible uh, among the, the people of, of, of those uh, two countries and then forging solidarity in a lot of, of, of areas of violation of, of human rights among the people with especially taking, uh, you know, really um, so much, uh, um, anti-abolitionist movement and, and, and anti-racism work that it is happening in, in, in the U.S. That kind of, of, of work is, is among people is, is very important. And, and uh, so with that, uh, let me expand the discussion. And uh, with this important documentary uh, and also go beyond it to the larger issue of a state violence in Iran. And to do this, I will turn to uh, Professor Payam Akhavan, who is a distinguished visiting professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. He's a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration and a former UN prosecutor at The Hague. And he's actually talking to us from The Hague today. He has published extensively on international criminal law and in 2017, he delivered the CBC Massey Lectures. Professor Akhavan was the first legal advisor to the prosecu prosecutor's office of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and also served with the UN in Bosnia, Cambodia, Guatemala, Rwanda, and Timor-Leste. He has served as the consul in notable cases before the European Court of Human Rights, the International Criminal Court, and the International Court of Justice, including the application of genocide convention case regarding the persecuted Rohingya minority. He also played a major role in an international people's tribunal in The Hague in 2012 aiming to investigate serious allegations of human rights violations and crime against humanity in the Islamic Republic of Iran during the 80s. So let me put what, we, what I, I will ask you, uh, Payam, in a, in a larger context. In a recent report by Amnesty International called the Blood-Soaked Secrets, we read about the massacre of political prisoners of 30 years ago. I consider this report and the Nasreen documentary as both serious warning signs, signs of ongoing crimes against humanity committed by the Islamic regime without impunity. Only in the last few days, we have witnessed the arrest of a group of women union activists, writers, among them a major campaign that has been started is to free Nahid, is Nahid Taqavi, and another Amnesty International communique, uh, communique which was issued only yesterday about Ahmad Reza Jalali, an Iranian Swedish specialist in emergency medicine, that he has been transferred to a solitary confinement in the notorious Evan prison and told by the prosecution authorities that his death sentence will be carried out imminently. More also in the last few days, again, home raids, arrests, arbitrary detention of Baha'is. What should be done? I mean, these are big questions, I know. But what is the role of international human rights groups and advocates? What options do we have in the realm of international human rights in dealing with this brutality of, of, of this regime? So let me start with that. And then, and then I, will, I, I will ask more questions uh, about the the larger human rights violation that it is happening throughout the Middle East 
Welcome, Payan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mojab, and uh, I'm grateful to Innis College for inviting me on this panel. And um, uh, I wish to begin by conveying my deepest uh, appreciation to Marsha Ross and Jeff Kaufman for an exceptional and timely uh, documentary. Uh, and as you, uh, I think, put it uh, rightly, Professor Mojab, there is a continuum between the systematic violence of the first years of the revolution and uh, the state's sponsored uh, violence uh, that we see personified through the struggle of Nasrin Sotoudeh uh, to speak truth to power. And I begin by recalling that um, uh, all that it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And I think that before speaking as an international lawyer, I have to speak as a human being. And we have to realize that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted in 1948 in the shadow of the Holocaust, the International Criminal Court uh, in the city of The Hague, where I find myself presently, all of these institutions and norms are meaningless if it's not for people like Nasrin Sotoudeh on the front lines fighting in the trenches for human rights. So this does not mean that what we say um, uh, in the outside world is uh, uh, insignificant or unimportant, uh, but it means that if there are people like Nasreen who are making such exceptional sacrifices, uh, we who have the freedom to act have uh, uh, that much uh, more of an obligation to do what we can to stand in solidarity with them. And it's in that context that I think this film is uh, highly significant. You mentioned the Iran tribunal that was held here in The Hague in 2012. For those of who may not be familiar, in 1988, uh, towards the end of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, the uh, mass uh, execution, systematic torture and violence that characterized the Islamic Republic's consolidation of power was, if you wish, consummated in the mass execution of an estimated 5,000 political prisoners within a span of a few days. Um, and the tribunal that we held here in The Hague was a people's tribunal because um, there is no international court which has jurisdiction in respect of Iran. Uh, because obviously the Islamic Republic will not recognize the jurisdiction of a court which would then turn around and prosecute its, its leadership. So all we did was through the testimony of some 100 survivors, simply let the Iranian public know the historical truth. And bearing witness, speaking truth to power is always the first step in affecting a more profound uh, social and political transformation. And I mention this because the impunity, as you mentioned, Professor Mojab, for these crimes explains why the DNA of violence still characterizes the Iran of today. Those who were responsible for this crime against humanity, for the mass execution of some 5,000 political prisoners, not only were they never punished, but they were promoted. They became uh, the Minister of Justice in the person of uh, uh, Mr. Poor Mohammadi. They became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in the person of Mr. Nayeri. And it's astonishing to think that the ranks of the Islamic Republic is populated by people who should be prosecuted for crimes against humanity. We should not be in the least bit surprised that someone like Nasrin Sutude is such a threat, such a threat to a regime that with the vast means at its disposable, the tremendous oil wealth of Iran, its military and security apparatus, why is it that a woman human rights defender who speaks truth to power is such a threat to the regime? And of course I have uh, an answer for that, but I will, we leave that for the remainder of our discussion. Uh, but I just want to end on, on one note that when we talk about power, 
we usually speak in terms of repression, violence, torture, imprisonment, but we have to ask ourselves, who is really powerful in this epic struggle? Is it the regime with all its resources or is it Nasrin Sotudeh, who has throughout all these years of repression uh, defied the regime and uh, uh, whom the regime has not succeeded in silencing. So I think the story of Nasrin is a reminder that we have to reimagine uh, our conception of power. And we have to understand that the real fight for the realization of human rights does not take place uh, in the United Nations, in the debates in academia, but it happens, if you like, uh, on the trenches. And it happens because there are people who are normal people, who have families, who have children, who have friends, who have dreams, who are willing to sacrifice all of that in order to uh, achieve justice. So once again, I, I thank uh, Jeff and Marsha for their uh, remarkable film and, and um, I will stop there. Thank you so much, Payam. But shall we, um, I, I would like to, to continue with a, um, a little bit of, of, of uh, your point about um, actually what is happening in, in the trenches. The trenches are, are, are full of um, um, former political prisoners that are, are they continue fighting um, after uh, they are released. Um, in the case of Iran, you know that a lot of, of them are living in, in diaspora, producing, archiving, documenting their experiences as well as, as their family members. I think that the continuous fighting of, of the family members in, in terms of, of, of bringing the atrocities committed by uh, these regimes in, you know, to the attention of, of, of the international community is extremely important. And I, I think that um, they, we also see that in, in, in the, uh, the Nasrin's documentary and then also the important of, of the, uh, the response of, of international community to it, including, for example, yesterday that Nasrin was, was awarded the, the highest uh, award of, of, of the city of, of Florence. So I think that we need to continue that, that um, um, struggle and, and make that international effort um, to uh, expand it to all the, the, the issue of, of, of imprisonment that it is happening, for example, in, in the Middle East. And, and, and let me just give you, and, and by the Middle East, I, I, I mean the entire Arab world and including Iran and, and, and Turkey, that in, in Turkey right now, there, the, in, in the last few weeks, there has been hundreds of, of, of arrests of, of, of Kurdish um, activists, intellectuals, there are many Kurdish women parliamentary members or members of, of, of different political groups that are detained. And I was stunned by reading about 16,000 detainees in Egypt or Zainab Janalian and other Kurdish women activists with life sentence in Iran. All of these people that constitute the citizens of, of these countries demanding justice, freedom, equality. And what they want is a, is a, is a system free from corruption, mostly secular and a democratic state. And as we see in Nasrin's Setude's case, that it is beautifully and powerfully presented in, in this documentary, that her courageous effort in fighting back the legal system. She also faces many legal obstacles, which makes her every time to realize the limits of the legal framework and, 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 and also make her realize that the limit is actually within the totality of, of the regime. And so I think that uh, the question of how to forge solidarity 
and then how to raise the international consciousness about all these violations that it is happening throughout the Middle East, the people who are fighting for justice, freedom, and democracy is where I would like you to sort of, of, of uh, give us your ideas. Tell us, you know, what else we need to do and then how this documentary can help us to build a larger international um, uh, relation, uh, international solidarity. Hey, um, well, these are very challenging questions for which there are no easy answers. These are generational struggles. I remember as a student protesting against apartheid and it was unthinkable, unthinkable back then in the 1980s uh, that one day Nelson Mandela would not only be released but that he would become the president of a multiracial democratic South Africa. Um, so I, I think we have to step back and realize that um, these are uh, painful, uh, long uh, historical struggles. We've had now the Islamic Republic for more than uh, 40 years and women are still struggling simply to go back to where they were under the laws of the Shah, uh, uh, which are referred to in the documentary, the laws from 1967, which reformed family uh, uh, relations and, and, and rights. So the I come back to the point that I mentioned earlier, and I think this applies uh, throughout uh, the, the Middle East, but also in the Western liberal world, which we recently realized um, uh, uh, is uh, uh, also subject to authoritarian tendencies and the undermining of rights. So we realize that we ourselves cannot be complacent. At the end of the day, judicial institutions and laws have effect if they have roots in popular consciousness. Uh, a court of law uh, uh, and uh, abstract norms uh, have no meaning if they're not situated in that wider political, social, and cultural context, um, which explains why um, someone like Nasrin Sutudeh has to maneuver within the limits of the Iranian legal system, which isn't so much just a question of Sharia versus secular law backward versus progressive laws, but simply the corruption of the judiciary in Iran, which is completely under the thumb of the executive, which is completely beholden to the dictates of the intelligence services. Um, so I go back to the fact that the struggles that happened um, on the streets, uh, the struggles which take place in conversations across the dinner table between friends and family and co-workers, those are also part of the wider seismic shift that eventually allows for the sort of transformation that we saw in South Africa in 1994. So whether we look at uh, uh, Iran, uh, the wider Middle East, um, we have to bear in mind that in authoritarian societies, it's very difficult to discern what is happening just beneath the surface. And I'm fairly confident that these regimes cannot rule indefinitely through instrumentalizing uh, hate and violence. It is simply unrealistic, never mind immoral, in the highly interdependent uh, world that we have of profound technological uh, transformation, uh, of dramatically uh, the different uh, generational consciousness and expectations that uh, the tide of history is on the side of those like Nasreen Sotudeh. So um, we uh, have to uh, maintain our own efforts in speaking truth to power, in exacting a cost for human rights abuses, in isolating those leaders that are responsible for perpetuating uh, these uh, uh, structures of injustice. But at the same time, we have to have faith that uh, even in the Western liberal world, we had centuries of violence and struggle before we achieved 
the liberties that we enjoy today. And sadly, the situation is no different uh, for the Middle East. But I do believe that the, many seeds have been uh, scattered, uh, which um, are not only going to bear fruit in time, but they are already uh, beginning to bear fruit in some of the conversations and discourses uh, that we witness today, which are quite uh, unprecedented and which would have been uh, unimaginable some years ago. And I would just end by perhaps saying something as a member of the uh, Baha'i minority, which I know features also in the film and the remarkable uh, courageous efforts of Nasrin Sotoudeh. Today in Iran, there's a conversation about religious tolerance, which was unimaginable just a generation ago uh, with the likes of uh, Ayatollah Montazeri, Ayatollah Masumi Tehrani, senior Shiite clerics who are questioning this hateful interpretation of religious law to justify the repression of uh, religious uh, freedom. Um, so I think that these spaces are being created in Iran and the renewed repression of the regime, if anything, uh, is a measure of its own desperation to hold on to power because it sees that uh, the old structures and sensibilities are, are beginning to slip away. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I agree with you, especially around this month and, 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 and the increase sort of of, of the, uh, the number of arrests of, of, of um, union workers, women and, and uh, um, artists and intellectuals that it is going on. It is a sign of, of, of discretion and it is a sign of, of, of the sort of, of also threat and, and uh, intimidation for um, speaking uh, up against the, the, the regime. Um, I, I just wanna make a, a point before moving back to Marsha and, 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 and Jeff, and that is the, the you know, I, I insist on, on really expanding uh, the um, solidarity um, uh, internationally and, and globally. There is a strong movement in, in, in the US, for example, the abolitionist movement that now, uh, you know, with this pandemic is, is trying to expand it, this notion of abolitionism beyond only prison, but also issues related to uh, racism, issues related to justice globally. And I think that the National Lawyers League, a very important entity in, in, in the US is, is working very hard with, with this uh, sort of, 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 of uh, the, the, the movement. And, and uh, for those of you who may not know, the, the lawyers, prominent lawyers of, 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 of this league that um, I think Payam, they, um, they also participated in, in the Iran People's Tribunal. Um, they, are, uh, they, they are thinking about um, how to uh, respond to uh, the, um, so much uh, violation of, of human rights, not only in Iran, but in the Middle East. So reaching out to them. And I would argue that by doing this, we are internationalizing the abolitionist movement. It would be a, a very good uh, strategy uh, to do. As I mentioned, the work of, of the family members of, of the prisoners is extremely important. So and in this film, Marsha and, and, and Jeff, that I would like to, to sort of, of, of get your reflection on it, the Nasreen's family, are, 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 and especially her husband, Mr. Reza Khandan, are play, playing a prominent role in support, in being outspoken, in reaching out uh, in order to create uh, the awareness about Nasreen's situations. Uh, Marsha, I will start with you and, and then Jeff, please do comment uh, on, on that too. Uh, what did working so closely uh, with Nasreen's family uh, teach you about her, about her struggle especially, and then also the role of family members 
of political prisoners. Marsha? Well, a few things. Uh, I've had so many thoughts going through my mind, Payam, as you were talking about what's going on in this country too. I mean, first of all, her family is extraordinary and very supportive. And, you know, I mean, one thing that Nazreen says all the time, we should not be silent. And I think that um, her family agrees. And I think that's what Reza does. I mean, Reza is her partner. He's her husband. They love each other so much, but he's also her partner in all this. She's not alone. And I think that's really, really important to feel like she can be out there doing what she's doing, knowing that her children are supported, that her children are well cared for, and that her husband basically has her back. And that we always would call him like uh, the Marty Ginsburg here, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's husband, you know, was such a champion of her and her work and, and enabled her to accomplish many great things. Her husband was equally as accomplished, but was able to kind of you know, stand by her side and encourage her and support her. Um, you know, one thing, a couple of things that I was just thinking about, um, going back to a question you asked is, you know, a question that I had a lot when we were making the film, and it was really important to me when we went abroad and we interviewed people um, like, like Massere and Shirin Abadi, uh, you know, and others, you know, as a mother myself, you know, this idea of, you know, kind of like sacrifice and, and, you know, like, how do you do that? Like, how do you put yourself out there in this very specific way in the event that, you know, you could go to prison and, you know, never come out and never see your children again and, and not be able to raise your children. And I think, yes, on the one hand, Nazreen has this incredible family, but what I really came to understand, you know, is this not a sacrifice for these people? This is, this is what they believe. It's the right thing to do. You know, it's bigger than just, you know, that other choice. It isn't a choice. And it, it's what they need to do um, and what they must do for the good of just not their, their, their children and also everybody else's children. And I think that's what you see in a lot of these people. And I, you know, Payam, you were talking about the legal system and I think thank God in our election right here that we just had in this country, you know, that the court system held up in all these challenges. And it was really difficult and it was touch and go. And what, what I was thinking about is how the, I'm sorry, Mitch McConnell and the Republican Party has just spent the last four years putting all these judges in place, all of these right-wing conservative, many underqualified judges, you know, to support the agenda of suppression in this country. You know, because that's what they're there for, to support suppression. And that's exactly what you talked about in Iran. And, um, but yet, you know, when the election was over, if those who were watching television, you see people dancing in the streets in this country. I mean, people were so relieved and so happy, but you know, really the fight has just begun because our courts are, are stacked now and it's very scary to me um, because there's gonna be a lot of pushback again, even with the, new, with, with the new administration. And so there's this interesting balance between people in this country, I think uh, over the last four years, waking up many of us to the fact that we can slip into autocracy at any time and that it's really incumbent on the citizens uh, to not think of it as sacrifice, but as the preservation of democracy. You know, and conversely, I feel, uh, and I really believe this, I think that the internet, you know, the great equalizer, you know, it, it, there are many bad things you can say about the internet and what it's done um, in terms of the spreading of a lot of negativity. But, what, what, but many people in countries that never had access to what was going on around the world had access now. And they can see what democracy looks like in other countries, or at least certain amount of freedoms look like. And as generations get older in Iran, young people, they know what it's like not to live in a country where religion, you know, dominates your life and there's all this suppression. And I think, at a certain point, you know, people get sick of what's going on and they fight back and it doesn't become a choice. It's what you just have to do. It's what I felt like when I saw the mothers here in this country in Portland, you know, the moms in their yellow jackets getting out there and fighting, you know, fighting back um, because they weren't willing to take it anymore, you know? And I think that that's a really important. And I think for so many people that you see like, you know, people that are like Nestreen, you know, they are not willing to continue. And if it means, you know, that they don't, that they're, they're not out there, you know, on the, you know, they're out there on the streets for as long as they can, but what they need to try to accomplish on behalf of the future of their society is much bigger than, you know, anything else for them. They're not thinking about what about me, what about me? They're thinking about the bigger picture. And I think when you want democracy, you do have to think about the bigger picture because there's constantly forces working against you 
uh, as we as I uh, we've just witnessed for four years here in the United States, there are forces constantly working against you to try to take that democracy for, from you because people who have power want to hold on to their power. They don't want to give it up. They don't. And I completely agree with what you're saying. And I know I'm going on and I'll stop in a second, but I completely agree with what you're saying. The government, this big government with all the repressive tactics, of course, they're afraid of Nazreen because she speaks for so many, you know, so many other people and she's not afraid of them. You know, she's not afraid to go to prison. She's not afraid to defy them. No matter how much they try to repress her, she's not afraid. And everything they can do can't stop her. And the more that she's talking about what she's doing, the more she is also inspiring people to not be quiet. And, you know, if you can't suppress people, you, you know, there will be change. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Marsha. Um, Jeff, do you want to um, comment on, on, on the same question that uh, the working so closely with, with um, Nasrin's uh, and, and, and especially her family, um, how was that for you? Well, first of all, I should just say I agree as usual with my partner and wife, Marsha Ross, and uh, I'm glad that she also uh, again made the connection between the challenges in this country and what we're portraying in Iran. It's something we've been aware of from the very beginning and something we talked about a lot with Nazreen while we were in production. And um, one of the things I've kind of resented is how some forces, especially in this country, um, you know, the Mike, the Mike Pompeos have tried to adapt the uh, rhetoric of concern about human rights in Iran uh, and it makes me just want to throw up because it's, uh, uh, you know, they have no moral standing whatsoever. And you, you can't embrace someone just for your own personal political gain and then ignore people who are doing the same work in other countries. Uh, you know, there's a reason why it's called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's got to apply to your own country and to every country equally. And so you can't, you know, celebrate uh, or call for the release of Nazarene so today and turn a blind eye to the women who have been imprisoned in Saudi Arabia because they demanded the right to drive or, or the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Um, you know, we, uh, we have to look at all countries and realize that we have to clean up our own house to have a moral voice uh, as part of the process of calling for rights for others. So um, I just think that's just absolutely essential. And, and thank goodness we're on some road to addressing some of those issues in this country now. But as you can see by the balance of the election, it's, it's gonna be very, very scary going forward. Um, you know, we learned every day and we learn every day from um, the example of Nazrin Sofadeh, Reza Khandan, uh, their children, Amerava and Nima, and their friends and colleagues. Uh, and there's many people that we got to know who we couldn't portray in the film or only briefly. For instance, there's uh, a remarkable human being, uh, Dr. Farhad Mezameh, who you see briefly uh, in the film on the steps of the uh, Iran Bar Association in a protest. Uh, he's uh, picked up by the police and Nazarene talks the cops uh, into letting him go. But uh, Dr. Mezume is, is, you know, you, you may never encounter him in your life. You may not read about him again, but this is an amazing human being in Iran who uh, repeatedly over and over again, uh, put himself at risk uh, for the rights of women and others uh, in, in that country. Uh, oftentimes he'd be someone who would put up bail money to get a political prisoner out. He was also a publisher along with being a doctor. Um, uh, when Nazreen was arrested, he went on a hunger strike and he himself got arrested for wearing a pin, a little button that said, uh, I oppose the mandatory hijab. That was enough to put him in prison. And um, the reports we've heard is that he's in the in prison now, that he has a very severe case of COVID-19 and uh, someone described the cell that he's been thrown in and now is ignored uh, as in, in just the most devastating ways. So Dr. Mezume is, is one person, but he's thousands, tens of thousands and, and it's heartbreaking. Um, <sighs> There's so much more I could say about Nazreen and Reza. Also, let me say one thing, and then I'd like to ask you two a question if that's okay. Uh, sure. I hope that's in the rules. Um, but, you know, so many times you talk to, to Nazreen uh, prior to arrest, and even just uh, when we recently spoke, to, uh, did a Zoom chat with Nazreen and Reza uh, after her um, temporary release, 
I'm just always so touched by their humor. I mean, they have the focus, they have the seriousness, they have the world vision, but they also have this humane humor that is just delightful. And so, um, you know, we can we can uh, joke about things. We told we told Nazarene Reza that we did an interview recently uh, with someone uh, in another country who was. Uh, originally from Iran. And after the interview, she, privately, she said, oh my goodness, I wish I could meet a man like Reza Condon and marry him myself. <laughs> and we were able to tell that to Nazreen and Reza and they laughed. And, you know, that's the kind of relationship we've had with them. Under the most difficult circumstances, um, there's always this human connection. And Reza will always say, hey, we're just ordinary people trying to do what we believe in. Um, and I think also that makes pursuing human rights more obtainable. You don't have to be you know, you don't have to be a god. You don't have to be carved out of marble. You don't have to be an icon. You can be a regular person and you know that these are values worth fighting for. And that's what Reza and Nazarene would say. Um, I'd love to throw a question at both of you if that's okay. Uh, early in the film, Nazarene says, uh, she talks about how she says, the authorities will say that uh, human rights are really a Western tradition. They're not really part of Iran. And she'll say, and she says that, um, that, you know, that, uh, and, and so therefore they don't have, they can ignore the concept of women's rights and human rights. And I wondered if you could address that. Um, can you describe perhaps how you see women's rights and human rights actually being embedded uh, in Iranian tradition and Iranian law and Islamic tradition and Islamic law? Uh, and and, and uh, give us an understanding of how that could bubble up and, and be part of the country now. Do you mind my asking that of you? Not at all, Jeff. Are you asking me or, or Payam? I'm asking both of you, if that's okay. okay. Um, Payam, I will go first and then, and then you can uh, continue. I, I think that it is very important for us to understand that there is a, and I always start by, by saying this, there is a century long history of uh, women's struggle for their rights then their rights include freedom, democracy, and the rights to control their own body and sexuality. This is very important to understand that there is this tradition, if we wanna call it, and I would call it this tradition of, of resistance, the tradition of a struggle. And uh, this is part of, of the political culture in Iran and also the rest of, of, of the, the Middle East. So I think that having this historical understanding, it makes sense to see that in the last 40 years, where women became the first target of the coming of, of this Islamic regime by enforcing the veil on, on them, curtailing their access to public, from education to employment, to even you know, become a lawyer and then have the rights to legal sort of, of, of a structure. Um, they are the force in the society that unceasingly, relentlessly have been fighting back against this regime. So it is important also to understand that there is that long history. There is this immediate four decades of, of, of a struggle of, of women for, for their rights. And it's incredible and remarkable to see that the way they resist, the way they dare to be out from the, you know, the, the uh, uh, women that are, are by taking off for uh, a short period of, of time, their, 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 their veil, their scarf, is uh, it is not only a symbolic act of refusing the enforcement of, of, of the veiling, but it is the, it's directly confronting the state because the state is uh, dictating all these rules and, 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 and social regulations. So everything about the Iranian women's struggle and resistance in the past and, and in the last 40 years is a direct confrontation with the state. And the veil is not only a symbol of, of covering women's 
her, but it is also the symbol of, of the, the, uh, this patriarchal regime and, 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 and the, a regime that violates not only women's rights, but all other rights that all these women are, are fighting for. The other thing that I want to add, and, and then I'll, I'll let Payama speak, is, is that throughout the Middle East, based on, on, on my research on, on women political prisoners in, in the Middle East, we have the largest prison population of, of women from Iran to Turkey to Egypt and, and Iraq, Syria, and when we call somebody a political prisoner, it means that they are in prison because of, of, of their mode of thinking, their ideas and their consciousness. And, and then thinking that this many women are imprisoned because they are directly confronting the state should give us a sense and a range of women fighting for democracy and freedom and their rights in the region. And it has to sort of a shift the discourse of, of the passivity of women in the Middle East or limiting them in, in their sort of the Muslim hood and in their culture and religion and taking away their political agency, their, their resistance that they are doing. Um, I'm gonna stop here and, and, and ask Payam to uh, add to it before we move into the some questions that are, are coming up in, in the chat box. Payam? Well, uh, I think Professor Mojab has made some very important points. I would just add some uh, uh, broad issues. Of course, uh, many Iranians will point to the famous uh, Cyrus Cylinder uh, from 450 BC. Um, which was uh, an edict, really, uh, uh, for religious tolerance uh, during the um, Achaemenid uh, uh, Empire. And uh, there are, of course, accounts of the American founding fathers being inspired by the Cyrus Cylinder and the drafting of the American Constitution. So this uh, narrative of human rights being uh, sort of uh, uh, an expression of Western cultural imperialism, I think is quite disingenuous, especially when it comes from repressive authoritarian regimes. This is not to say that culture is irrelevant to our understanding of uh, human rights. And uh, in that regard, uh, I think in your own film, um, you begin by pointing to all of those historical antecedents in Iranian history. Um, Mrs. Abadi uh, makes a very interesting point that women in Iran got the vote many years before Switzerland, which only gave the women the vote in 1971. Uh, and we have uh, had uh, both before and after the Islamic revolution, women playing remarkably important roles uh, in Iranian society. And in that regard, uh, unlike let's say Saudi Arabia, which is a traditional conservative uh, Islamic society, um, the Islamic revolution is a form of radical ideology, which has tried to turn the clock back to put the women uh, back rather than simply maintaining the status quo. Um, and uh, I believe the regime has uh, spectacularly failed. And your film is a great illustration um, of that uh, failure. Uh, but it also goes to show that um, misogyny, and it's not just patriarchy, I think patriarchy is too light a word to describe what is in effect a, a, a misogynous, uh, a hateful, violent repression of feminine ideals, not just women, but of the wider uh, idea that we have about feminist epistemology, different ways of knowing the world, different ways of defining power and social and, and political uh, relations. So in that regard, um, I think the women's movement in Iran is absolutely central to uh, democratic transformation. And as I've said before, um, uh, Nasrin Sotoudeh may very well become our Nelson Mandela when the time comes in Iran. Uh, the new leadership, I'm sure, will be populated by many of these 
extraordinarily impressive and, and heroic women, Nargis Mohammadi, and the, the list is actually uh, quite long. And I want to, in that connection, just make one uh, further point, um, which is the role of the mothers of Khavaran, the mothers who mourn the loss of the children after the executions of uh, 1988. And then in subsequent years after the 2009 Green Movement, the mothers of Lale Park. Uh, uh, and one can uh, think about the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, who um, defied the, the military junta by coming right in front of the presidential palace and protesting, demanding the truth about what happened to their children. So I think that that is yet another expression uh, of the, the power, if you like, that women have had in creating a culture of protest and resistance uh, to, to repression. And I will uh, end by simply saying one, uh, uh, one thing. The uh, Islamic Republic, of course, succeeded uh, because it was a popular movement, whether we want to admit it or not. Millions of people poured out in the streets of Tehran when Khomeini had his messianic return from uh, Paris. And of course, uh, people had their own uh, romantic ideas of a utopia that would uh, uh, sort of uh, be ushered in. And then, and then, as is the case with most revolutions, the reality turned out to be very different uh, than, than the romance. Um, but I, I uh, mention this because uh, I think that, in a sense, one needs to move towards this post-ideological phase uh, in order to create a culture of uh, human rights. And uh, in that regard, uh, the fact that those that are standing up against the regime today are ordinary people, as you put it, Nasrin Sotude does not come from the upper classes in the north of Tehran. She's exactly the sort of person that the revolution spoke about defending. She comes from a traditional religious family in Iran, and she then becomes an icon of the struggle uh, against the Islamic Republic. The mothers of Khavaran, there is a universality to the pain of a mourning mother, which no regime can deny. You cannot possibly silence a mother who has lost her children. So these are all, as I said, uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, death by a thousand cuts, if you like. All of these uh, semi seemingly innocuous transactions cumulatively are bringing about a seismic shift in a popular consciousness. And I would say the increased repression by the regime may very well be a dying convulsion uh, rather than a show of strength. It is that desperation to hold on to power uh, uh, against the uh, growing uh, demands for change by the majority of uh, Iranians. Thank you so much, uh, Payam. There are uh, many questions also coming up in, 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 the, in the chat and we have only a few more minutes left. It seems that we just started the panel and, and, and started very important conversation here that, that we can continue. Um, Jeff, if you are satisfied with our uh, little intervention here, I will move on and, and ask them and ask uh, some questions from, from the, the, the chat. And, and maybe I will just start, uh, uh, in fact, asking you, Payam, that um, the daughter of uh, Nahid Taqavi, a prisoner um, that is a, a woman activist who has been recently imprisoned and, and, and she has been in prison for a, for a month now and, and, and with no connection to the family and, and, and no news about what is, uh, what is uh, happening to her. She is actually asking the, the, the question that who is responsible and, and what is the role of, of, of the international community? How can, how can we cannot sort of, of, of start 
a, a campaign for a one political prisoner all the time. And again, this is happening by, by the family members and, 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 and all of that. But what else can we done in, in order to uh, you know, sort of, of, of put those who are uh, committing all these crimes um, in front of, of, of some kind of an international community and, and make them accountable? for the crimes that they are committing. So let's just start with that. And, and, and then there are questions that I will ask Jeff and Anne Marsha. It is an incredibly important question with a very disappointing answer. And the disappointing answer is that uh, the uh, International uh, Criminal Court, the institutions that have been created to hold leaders accountable for such crimes um, uh, uh, under the current system of international law require the consent of states. Iran must consent to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court before the court can investigate and prosecute anyone. And of course, we know that the national courts in Iran are wholly inadequate because they are themselves uh, instruments of repression. That is exactly why um, uh, we are left with the basic impulse to speak truth to power. We have civil society, we have uh, filmmakers, we have writers, we have human rights uh, uh, and civil society uh, organizations, uh, we have people's tribunals. So the answer to the question as to who's responsible, where there are a lot of people responsible because there is a system of criminality. It's not just one or two people, it's a system which uh, is built on the violation of the most basic rights of human beings. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there is no immediate means of holding these people accountable. It's more a question of a historical struggle. Uh, but I'm going to just say one last thing. There has been a move in recent years to speak about targeted sanctions, which I think is quite important. Uh, travel bans, uh, asset freezes, naming and shaming particular individuals rather than condemning this abstraction called the government. The government at the end of the day consists of individuals in positions of authority uh, making decisions. Um, so uh, I think that we, we need to uh, explore uh, that uh, option uh, as well. Thank you so much, Pam. There are um, several questions, um, uh, Marsha and, and, and Jeff, and I will uh, leave it to you, whoever wants to answer them, that uh, a lot of, of people, uh, actually we, we got the, the uh, registration number that more than 200 people watched the film since we, uh, since they registered to participate in, in, in this panel. But also, but they are asking that, what are your plans for making the movie accessible for wider audience and and also how can people watch it again because some people are, are writing that they um, didn't have a chance to watch it within the 48 hours window that that uh, we provided for for them so um, let us uh, discuss that um, and may, maybe Marsha do you want to start and, and, and yeah. Then, yeah. yeah yeah I was just writing something and I wasn't hoping we would get to this question and I just wrote something in the the Q and A for people. So, okay, the film is going to have uh, a limited virtual theatrical starting December 18th across North America, which also includes Canada. And obviously if, if movie theaters are closed right now, but um, in much the same way you would watch something on your television, it'll be available for streaming, which means you'll go to a, a theater and you'll buy a stream and then you can watch it at home and you'll have the 48 hours once you start to watch it. Our website is www.nazrinefilm.com. And on there, please sign up for our website. Uh, please sign up because we do, we do a monthly and bi-monthly newsletter, which does regular updates about, you know, where you can see the film, what's going on with the film, and also what's going on with Nazreen herself. But also, I believe even this, by the end of this week, we're gonna have a page that says screenings find a theater. So what will happen is if you go to that page, uh, you will be able to find a theater where the movie's playing. And, and the beauty for people who haven't yet watched film through virtual cinema is that uh, you don't have to be at a theater in Toronto. You know, you can buy your stream to any theater, any of the 20 or 30 plus theaters that where the film will be playing 
in North America. And it's gonna be in Chicago in theaters in Duluth, Minnesota and New York and Chicago and Cleveland. So you can go to any one of those theaters and buy your stream. So that's what's happening in North America because we also have two distributors. So we have a it geo-blocked in this case uh, through if in North America for, for theater and also VOD, which is Amazon and iTunes and Voodoo and Hulu and you know every other thing, that's going to be January 28th. And that'll also be available all across North America. We, what we've also done is make sure that there are also Farsi subtitles for the English part of it too. It was recently shown in Iran, but it was completely dubbed. All English was dubbed into Farsi, but here we'll have subtitles. Additionally, we also have international distribution. We have a separate distributor who's based in Paris and they are selling a 55 minute version of the film in, uh, for television all you know, across the rest of the world outside North America. So it won't be the full length feature of the film. And then April 1st, they'll be producing their own, uh, you know, they'll be also releasing it on VOD and also they'll be releasing it um, you know, internationally, but you know, to watch it sooner, obviously you'd have to do it through North America. And also on January 28th, day and date will also be released. The DVD will also be available on Amazon. But again, you have to please go to the website, uh, find a theater. And I just want to add one more thing. Uh, you know, one thing that was really important to us, and um, I think all, everyone's really touched upon it, you know, the people of the country are not the government of the country. And, you know, Iran is an incredibly beautiful place. And something that was really, really important for us to capture in the film, you know, the beauty of Iran, you know, to be a citizen of Iran. And I, I think that's something that's really moved us tremendously is people from Iran who can no longer return, who can't go there, seeing their country portrayed this way. And particularly those of you who have parents who were born in Iran, who've never been able to visit Iran. You know, what we've heard is a wonderful thing to share with your parents um, uh, because it's, um, you know, it, it's a visit to a country in a, in, a, in a different way. Besides the politics, it's also the humanity of the people and the people that live there or as Payam and, uh, you know, uh, Shazad is saying, you know, she's a normal person, you know, she's not an elite person. And we, we really wanted to capture that, that humanity. So again, and please, I would say one last thing, please tell everybody you know to see the movie because the, the more that we can talk about the film, you know, the film is part of the conversation about Nazreen. And we've been really active in a global effort to help get her out of prison. If she returns to prison, it's going to be even more necessary. So um, the film sparks dialogue about what we can all do for Nazreen. And also on that website, there are opportunities for you to sign petitions and to find out what actions that you could also take to help get Nazreen out of prison and keep her out of prison. Jeff? You said that perfectly, but uh, I will uh, reiterate that you can go to the website at www.nazreenfilm.com. That's a way not only to follow Nazreen's story, uh, how you can see the film, but also how you can participate. I should note that Nazreen is home uh, on medical leave now. Uh, she had a severe heart condition, which has plagued her for some time and was exasperated by a 46 day hunger strike. Uh, but, um, you know, what happened was she was in a deep prison and the authorities said, oh, we're going to take you to the hospital for some treatment. They put her in a car and they drove her to Garshak prison, which is about 30 miles uh, outside of Tehran, and which is called the dirtiest, most unsafe prison in Iran, and the worst place for women in Iran. And it's in Garshak soon thereafter that she caught COVID. Uh, when she was sent home on medical leave, uh, they found out that she had COVID, and uh, she also infected her husband and her children. So she's recovering now, um, but uh, the threat continues. And uh, it's now public that uh, the government um, officially expects her to return to prison in early December. So she's home with her family now, but you can just weep at um, the pain that they intend to further inflict. And as we've said over and over and over again, uh, we are focusing on Nazreen, but Nazreen from the very beginning, when we first said, hey, Nazreen, can we do a documentary about you? She wanted it to be through her about others. And so um, part of getting involved is realizing, yes, it's Nazarene's story, but it's also Nargis Mohammadi's story. And it's also uh, so many other uh, women uh, and men, uh, either now in prison or uh, facing that risk and in Iran and around the world. So, um, you know, we're just so grateful that uh, we can have this um, gathering here today through Innes College 
And as Marcia said, you know, the conversation and the process has to keep moving forward. Thank you so much, Jeff. We have only a few minutes before uh, I pass on so-called the mic uh, to my colleague, uh, Charlie Kyle. But I would like to thank you, Marsha and, 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 and Jeff for making this film. And as a teacher, I would say that to give me a tool, especially a pedagogical tool um, to discuss the uh, violation of our women's rights uh, in Iran and, and also in the Middle East, but also an, an activist tool. They, as, as you said, that um, uh, it is a Nasreen's story is, is many, many Nasreen's stories, other Nasreen's or, or uh, Nazanin's or, or Nahid's that are all in, 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 in prison now. As also, um, it's the first thing that Nasreen said that when uh, she had this temporary re release was that the, the slogan, which I, I, I think, and it's something that she feels deeply and, 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 and uh, emotionally that free all political prisoners. I really would like to see this notion of free all political prisoners to become something that we can build an international solidarity around that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, Professor Payam Akhavan. Always, it's important to hear your um, sort of, of, of uh, views legally and, and within the framework of, of human rights and, and, and international law. Thanks again to um, NS and, and, and their wonderful staff. It was a pleasure working with you and, and, and pulling this, this panel together. As I started by saying that a year ago, November started with much disaster, pain and sorrow for Iranians, started with the suppression of uh, protesters and then also followed in January by the killing of uh, 176 passengers and nine crew members on board of the Ukraine airline. And, and then in January hit the COVID-19 pandemic. And then the continuous arrest with now the country that it is hit by grave poverty. Therefore, as, as Payam mentioned, um, there will be uh, resistance there will be fight back. People will not be quiet and, and will not tolerate this much uh, violence of, of their rights. So uh, please take care of yourself and, and also each other and you all be well. And I will ask uh, Charlie to close the session. Thank you so much, Sharzad. Um, I'll just echo Sharzad's comments that this was for me, a, a an illuminating um, and provocative discussion. And I'm just grateful that we had the opportunity to facilitate it. Um, again, I'll say this was all Charzette's doing. <laughs> it was her brainchild. And I want to salute Jeff and Marsha for the film and for advancing, you know, the knowledge we can all share about uh, what's going on in Iran. And I especially appreciated the, uh, you know, tips towards advocacy and how the international community can do something because observing is one thing, but actually participating is another. Um, I will just say in closing that we have another event uh, tomorrow night. Um, it's a screening of the Grizzlies. In this case, the um, screening will be incorporated into the event as a whole. So the, it will be a screening followed by a discussion. And uh, I'll just note that uh, the director, Miranda de Pensier, will be part of it, but also two of the producers, Alethea Arnacook Barrell and Stacey Ugluck McDonald. And it will be moderated by actor Brandon Oakes. So uh, I hope if you're interested in uh, a, you know, a fictional representation of some of the struggles for the Inuit community um, up north, that you will join us for that tomorrow at uh, six o'clock. So again, thanks to all the panelists, thanks to Sharzad, and uh, have a good afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thank you, bye. Bye, Sharzad, thank you so much. Phenomenal, thank phenomenal. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you to you and, and, and uh, 
Jeff and, and Payam, uh, I, I think that it is such an important topic that we can continue more of, of, of this conversation, really. It was fantastic. Thank you so much for, I know all of you are, are very busy and, and, and accepting this invitation and Charlie for scheduling us in into a very busy time and at NS, thank you so much. The staff at NS were phenomenal in, in organizing and facilitating. I'm really appreciative of, of what they did. Thank you. Yeah, we're happy to help. And if you have another one, just let us know. <laughs> I'll just point out, I don't know if you were able to track this, but I don't think you lost a single participant through the entirety of the 90 minutes. So clearly it was a galvanizing discussion. So oh, congratulations on that. Um, oh, that's, that's lovely. Yeah, I have, to, I have another meeting I'm now late for, but it was worth uh, sticking around for the whole thing. So thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, Charlie. Bye. Bye.